Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, why the major parties can't decide on who should be the Speaker of the House. Campaign finance reform from the most unlikely source, the New South Wales right of the ALP. And why one of the world's richest men plans to spend his children's inheritance. Our panel tonight, blogger and regular contributor to The Drum website, website Anthony, Anthony Lowenstein, Joe Stella from the Daily Grind website, and also in Canberra, David Crowe, Chief Political Correspondent with the Australian Financial Review. First to the unfolding situation at Sydney's Villawood Detention Centre where a group of asylum seekers continue their protests on the roof there. Two men had agreed to come down but nine others are still refusing to come down and have been threatening to harm themselves. They want immigration authorities to grant them asylum. The protest was sparked by the apparent suicide of a Fijian man at the detention centre yesterday. Now just before we came on air I spoke to Sarah Nathan, a representative of the Australian Tamil community who said that she'd heard that representatives from the UNHCR were on their way to Villawood and that she was confident that that would mean that the men would come down soon after they arrive. Now, Annie, you visited Villawood Detention Centre on the weekend. Yeah. Um, you've been in touch with people inside Villawood Detention Centre. What's the latest you can tell us? The mood of a lot of people. I spend time with Tamils, Afghans, Iraqis, Pakistanis and others. This is on Sunday, so all of two days ago. It was really one, I think, of desperation. Some people's claims had been rejected, some had been accepted and some are waiting for security clearance. One of the things, the issues with this whole debate, and I've sort of heard this afternoon also the UNHCR was hopefully going to come and agree to something or at least some kind of compromise that get the men off the roof, which is what all of us want safely, is that the Immigration Department had consistently told most of these men that the countries from where they come from are now safe. Iraq, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka. Now, anyone who knows anything about those countries, who looks at any human rights report, UN reports, knows that for anyone who's fled those countries, for whatever the reason may be, and many of them were tortured in those countries by various forces, to suggest, as the Australian government does, that they're safe, which is what they're told, is absurd. And more important... If, if we take just the issue of Sri Lanka, because a lot of people argue that Sri Lanka is now safe to go back to. Yes, they do claim that. Now, there's no doubt that the war ended last May. Certainly it's better than it was. There aren't massive bombs falling from the air from the Sri Lankan government. That's true. But if you're a Tamil in Sri Lanka and live in the north or the east, which is where most Tamils live in that country, and most human rights reports that, um, explain this, there's still massive discrimination against Tamils. There's an inability actually to find work. There's torture. There, there is numerous evidence to show that when some Tamils have re been returned by the Australian government to Colombo Airport, they are taken away and tortured, if not worse. And the question we have to really ask ourselves is why is the Australian government not taking any responsibility for what is clearly a breach of international law? Anthony, on the issue of Villawood Detention Centre, I mean, one of the things that surprised me is that so many people have been able to get on the roof. We saw it start with only, I think, about somewhere between two and four people. Yeah. And then at one stage there was 13 people on the roof. Mm. Now, have you got any understanding how they've been able to get up there and why the, the staff at the detention centre in Villa would ha have allowed this to happen? In a simplest form, I don't know exactly how that happened. Presumably, there are the, the staff may have been overwhelmed. One of the things I think that um, is important to discuss about detention centres are that most people don't know that every detention centre in Australia is run by a private company, Serco, a British firm who have massive multinational input around the world. And there's incredible amounts of evidence both in Australia, the UK and elsewhere when in this company runs private detention centres or private prisons, especially in the UK and here too, a great deal of discrimination and abuse happens and yet when the Australian government is asked about this, they either defer to Serco and Serco defers back to the Immigration Department, there is no accountability of the whole nature of privatisation of detention centres and I think most Australians and in fact the media are rarely in fact even asking when, for example, last week we were told Curtin was going to expand. Who's going to run that? Serco is going to run that. Who's going to run the centre in the Cape York? OK, I want, to go to, I want to go to David Crow on that. David, how do you think that the, uh, the government has handled this? I think it's a very difficult situation where you have a suicide. The government cannot be seen to be responding to a suicide threat from somebody who's in detention. Uh, so the government today, I think, is responding in as well a fashion as it possibly could. Now, looking at the bigger political picture on this issue, um, uh, I, I, I think uh, it's, it's, we're, we're looking at a situation where Labor knows pretty much that one reason they're in government is because they've begun to take a firmer line, a tougher line, on asylum seekers. Uh, and it's very difficult now for them to relax their position on that or to modify it. Uh, I was very interested to see the images a moment ago of CFMEU, the union uh, uh, members, 
pa uh, participating in the protest outside the Villawood Centre. Um, we could be looking at um, a debate within Labor about its detention policies. Uh, this could end up being a test for Julia Gillard's commitment to have a more open debate within the Labor caucus, where caucus members could stand up and seek to influence the government policy on this. But the bottom line for the government would be very difficult for them to, uh, to soften their position on asylum seekers when that policy was one of the reasons they feel they held on to power. Joe, your response to uh, what's been going on at Villawood and the political ramifications of it? Well, I certainly worry uh, what's going to happen to detention centres after this, uh, this crisis at the moment is resolved. For, for genuine asylum seekers uh, coming into Australia, uh, each, each successive wave of them is facing detention centres that are more and more like prisons. Um, and it's because of this sort of uh, behaviour what is Serco going to be asked to do? They're going to be asked to make sure that we don't have this sort of situation happening again, and that means basically a prison-like environment, even more so than it is today. I mean, we saw under the Howard government that, that detention centres went from being you know, secure reception centres all the way through to being quasi-prisons now. They're being run by companies with expertise in, in running prisons. Now, with, with, with this sort of stunt... Um, it's going to have to get closer and closer until it is uh, indistinguishable from a prison. So uh, the actions of these men um, is, is only going to hurt other asylum seekers, perhaps genuine asylum seekers, uh, in future. Anthony, can you see a backlash? From the public, you mean? No, no, from... not from the public, but to those inside the detention centres, that things will get tougher, that uh, they'll be under more scrutiny, and like Joe is suggesting. If history is any guide, I fear that maybe... <laughs> At the same time, this is not to defend the idea of someone committing suicide by any means, but, and this is not to defend jumping on a roof and threatening to throw yourself off. However, people are desperate, and if you, as virtually every mental health expert, including Patrick McGorry, you know, Australian of the Year, said yesterday, if successive governments, Howard government, Rudd government, now Gillard government, aren't listening to the message of locking people up indefinitely for years often. This is some people, in fact... Well, in, in fairness, I mean, they are, they are locked up for a long period of time because there are all those avenues of appeal. It's not like we meet them at the beach and say, get lost. There is a process and there is an opportunity for decisions to be reviewed. Indeed, there is. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is why is the government deciding to keep people locked up in a prison-like situation for so long? I'm not suggesting, and no one, most people I know who are involved in the refugee community, so to speak, aren't saying anyone who comes and claims asylum should just be let into the... I don't believe that. It should be checks and balances. I've got no problem with that. A month, two months, however long it takes. But this is not about that. This is about punitive, vindictive action to try and keep, A, the public away from seeing what goes on, which is what that Pacific Solution was all about. And if the Gillard government's successful in opening up something in Nauru... Timor, I noticed PNG put their hand up today for it as well. This will have exactly the same effect, to locking people up indefinitely. Okay. That's the point. David Crow, I want to ask you about the comments made by Professor Pat McGorry, the Australian of the Year. He's previously said um, that the, the uh, detention centres are factories for producing mental illness, and he's today called for a bipartisan review of immigration detention centres. Are we likely to see something like that, some kind of review? I know the Greens have called for something similar. I think that there's actually a, a reasonable chance of a bipartisan review. But we're now looking at a situation where these kinds of issues go to the floor of the parliament. So instead of seeing a government review, I think that the likely option is a review by the parliament. And we've got the Greens wanting a review. I would, uh, I would think that Andrew Wilkie would support that kind of initiative. Perhaps other independents would as well. And there's no reason why this couldn't be considered on the floor of the Parliament by a House of uh, Representatives committee. And that could be one way of taking forward what Patrick McGorry is suggesting. Now, I think I'd personally be ca uh, cautious about the prospects for that review then changing government policy, but there's no reason why it couldn't. And we're now, work, uh, we're now uh, in a situation where Parliament has those opportunities to raise the debate, get the issues out there more widely, which is a good thing. Joe, there, if there is a review, is it, un is it likely to change government policy? I would think in the current environment it, it would not be. Um, Labor needs to be tough on this issue, and I think more broadly Australia needs to be seen to be tough when it comes to issues of, of migration, because otherwise it will encourage uh, more people to make the perilous journey. Uh, to Australia and put themselves and Australian servicemen and women uh, in danger.
I think, though, I mean, the other thing is what is the alternative to detention? I mean, among this group, and I'm certainly not saying this is everyone who applies for asylum in Australia, among this group there are people who are genuinely desperate, who will do anything, and that's what we're seeing today. To let these people out into the community while we're processing their applications uh, seems like it would be foolhardy. I don't think that could possibly work. But other countries do that, though. I mean, New Zealand in, t in part does that. This is not to idealise the New Zealand model. New Zealand but wouldn't is... get as many asylum seekers as Australia. No, but... It... No, they don't. But in the scheme of things, we aren't talking about that many people. So much of the rhetoric about this issue is about the fact that we potentially might get this sort of avalanche of people coming from somewhere, Indonesia or elsewhere. There's no reason at all why you can't have... If there have been checks and security checks done, no one suggests there shouldn't be, to release people in a certain environment. No one suggests us to let people out freely, but there must be a way to avoid the mental problems we have seen for now over a decade in Australia. And other countries have shown us how to do that. I mean, Can it's you not like... about ankle tags? Or, I mean, what is the specific alternative to detention you're... you're... I'm thinking of in New Zealand, for example, they haven't got ankle tags. They simply are monitored in a way. And, and the question is, the implication of what you're saying is that people might disappear. My understanding of New Zealand is that virtually no one, if not nobody, has disappeared, wandered away into the community. It doesn't, I'm not saying it never would happen, but it's unlikely to happen. And that's why being humane doesn't make it a soft touch. It simply means treating people with respect. OK, we will talk more about this issue a little later in the program when Senator Sarah Hanson-Young joins us, who, uh, of course, is the immigration spokesperson for the Greens, and they've uh, called today for a review of immigration detention. But let's move on and talk about uh, the ongoing issue of who is going to be the Speaker. It's Parliament sitting next Tuesday. And the Labor leader of the House of Representatives, Anthony Albanese, has accused the coalition of crab walking away from parliamentary reform. There's a stalemate between the major parties over who will provide a Speaker after the opposition effectively kiboshed the idea of independent Rob Oakeshott being nominated on constitutional grounds. If the rhetoric is to be believed, then someone is losing uh, a pairing right as a Speaker and therefore that's, that affects substantially the numbers on the floor of the House. So a few people now have to either um, start to rethink some of their rhetoric uh, and, uh, you know, let's see whether they truly do believe it's a Section 40 issue or really a Rob Oakeshott issue. But Tony Abbott insists he just wants to get on with the job. The opposition will be as constructive as we possibly can be. Uh, we want to make this parliament work. Yes, it's going to be difficult, um, but I don't think that the public uh, should go back to the polls any time soon. I regret uh, the outcome, but we've got to accept that this is democracy. So, David Crowe, Anthony Albanese says that uh, the coalition is crab-walking out of the deal. Does Tony Abbott have a legitimate reason to, to back out of this deal? Or one, at least one aspect of it? He has some valid reasons for, uh, for changing position, but there's no denying that what he is doing is modifying a position that looked like a very public agreement that he reached with Labor and the independents only a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, I think that he's well within his rights to, to turn down the prospect of Rob Oakeshott being Speaker. Rob Oakeshott is one member among 150. There was no requirement on the coalition to accept him as the Speaker. Uh, and the argument about the Constitution, the fact that the Constitution says that the Speaker does not have a vote on the floor of the Parliament, only a casting vote from the Chair, there is some merit to that, to that argument um, because a pairing arrangement could be seen to be not being in the spirit of the Constitution. It's a very fine legal argument to get into there. I think the problem for Tony Abbott is that uh, if he's walking away from an agreement that was reached only a few weeks ago, uh, the question is whether he's playing a constructive role in the parliament or not. And there is that risk that he'll, uh, he'll lose some uh, or raise some concerns in the community about his approach to the parliament. Now, this holds some dangers, I think, for Tony Abbott because it was only, uh, well, I think it was last week that he talked about the the, the prospect of a change of government on the floor of the parliament. If he wants a change of government on the floor of the parliament, he needs, he needs to love.